OK, let's look at this week's questions. Question one, why do you think Catherine Driscoll feels like she had to start her dissertation over in the direction of her seminar paper? So this is on page 188. Um, remember Stoner reads her dissertation and goes to her home to return it. She invites him in. They talk about things. And then um, their conversation drifts toward that seminar, that class with uh, Walker in it. Um, and suddenly here she says, oh, it's shameful. She burst out. It's shameful. The seminar you were. I had to start it over after the seminar. It's shameful that they should. She paused in bitter, furious confusion, got up from the couch and walked restlessly to the desk. So what's going on here? Of course, first of all, she's thinking about how Walker uh, disrupted the seminar and um, attacked Stoner in his so-called presentation. Uh, the same presentation where Stoner thought he was attacking Catherine. So that's the first part, but that's not shameful. I mean, it's bad that it happened, but there's no sh shame for uh, they, who is they, right? Walker is just a he. So this must be referring to the fact that um, after that presentation, there was this whole fight about uh, letting Walker pass the exam, and then Lomax gets made chair, and then Lomax gives Stoner the worst possible teaching schedule. Um, the novel did say in, at the end of the last chapter that um, the feud between Lomax and Stoner became part of Stoner's legend in the department. So all the students know about this. And no matter whether they know why it happened, they all know that Lomax and the department is being unfair to Stoner. So I think that's what she's talking about here. Uh, this entire series of events began with that seminar. So that's the background. Now, why does she feel like because of this situation, she had to start it over uh, in the direction of the seminar? Well, if you remember, um, when the students first realize that Lomax and Stoner are fighting, uh, if you look back on page 177, near the bottom of the page. Uh, it says, former students of his, even students he had known rather well, began nodding and speaking to him self-consciously, even furtively. So these are the students that are kind of afraid of pissing off Lomax by being too close to Stoner. But a few were ostentatiously friendly. Ostentatious means obvious. Uh, going out of their way to speak to him or to be seen walking with him in the halls. Uh, so these, of course, would be the students who want to show their support for Stoner. Uh, so therefore it says one was seen with him or not seen with him for special reasons. And special here would mean political reasons. So if we think about how the students have divided themselves, um, then we can sort of guess that maybe Catherine has also done something similar. She feels the need to side with Stoner against Lomax because what Lomax did was very unfair. So the way that because she's not really a student, right? She was only sitting in on his seminar. Uh, she's a PhD student and part time instructor. So the only way that she can show her support or the best way, I think, is if uh, she showed support for Stoner's research. And the way to show support for his research is 
to do her own research on the same or in the same direction to show that his research is important. It's worth following. Uh, so that's why she says I had to start it over uh, in the direction of Stoner's research uh, and in the direction of the seminar. Right, that's the key flashpoint. That's when things started happening and people started taking sides. Um, now, the quest, the final question here is, why does Catherine feel the need to take sides? Right, she's not a student. In fact, since she's a part-time teacher, it would be to her advantage if she sided with Lomax. It would help her career, right? Stoner is nobody. Uh, if she needed uh, help with something, Lomax would have more resources to help her. So why does she have to si feel like she has to side with Stoner? Well, the surface reason is, of course, because uh, Walker looked like he was attacking her paper when actually he was attacking Stoner. So she is already involved in this situation. Uh, and she sees that it is entirely unfair to Stoner. So the right thing to do would be to side with him against Lomax. But we know that uh, because we have finished reading chapters 12 to 14, we know that another reason is because she admires him. Uh, maybe even has a crush on him. Uh, so she identifies with him. She feels the need to be on his side. OK, question two. Do you think Stoner is attracted to Edith and Catherine in different ways? If so, how? Like how? What are the different ways? Um, so you may think that it's the same kind of attraction, but I personally think that it is two different kinds of attraction. And uh, you know, this is one of those questions that would really, really benefit from in-class discussion. Uh, but sadly, because of COVID-19, it's going, it's really hard to do that. I'm thinking about this question actually about um, discussions over Microsoft Teams. If um, next semester we have to continue with remote classes for any reason or restart remote classes, uh, from the middle of the semester. Uh, I might I'm, I'm going to try to think of a way to still continue class discussions. Um, like maybe open up uh, different channels, one channel for each question, and you can like choose which question you want to talk about with your classmates or something. I don't know. This semester happened too fast. I uh, wasn't able to plan for that. Um, but you know, discussions are important. I wrote these questions with discussion in mind. So uh, if you think that they are the same kind of attraction to both Edith and Catherine, um, you know, we can take a closer look at what kind of attraction uh, each of them has for Stoner. The first person, Edith, seems to have attracted Stoner because of her uh, lady-like grace, her culture, her polish, her poise, the fact that she appears to be a perfect uh, lady. So it seems like Stoner was taken by her beauty and her like refinement, so external things, or like the way that she behaves. If you remember that scene at the party where he first meets her, he is completely dumbstruck uh, by her appearance and her voice and the way that she presents herself. What about Catherine Driscoll? What attracts him to her? It seems like the thing that attracts him is her research, right? At the beginning of this chapter, it describes how when he finally starts reading her dissertation in the library, he couldn't stop. It was so interesting to him. So and uh, throughout the rest of these three chapters, we see how um, they constantly mix 
intellectual conversation with the other um, trappings of a romantic relationship or the kinds of things that couples do. So it seems like he is attracted to her mind and her personality. Um, and if we think back to Edith, he didn't really know her personality. He only saw the way that she presented herself. Um, only after they get married. Well, I guess um, when he's still courting her and he goes to her aunt's place and they have a conversation and all those times when Edith was behaving kind of weirdly, I guess he could have gotten a glimpse of her personality, but he's too inexperienced. He doesn't understand women enough to understand what's going on or what kind of woman or person Edith could be or might be under her presentation as the perfect lady. So uh, that relationship seems to be built on not personality, but like first appearances, first impressions. Uh, but here he really seems to uh, like Driscoll, Catherine Driscoll for her mind and the way that they get along with each other. It seems like what we today would consider a more uh, traditional romantic relationship where two people love each other and get along very well with each other. Uh, so to me, it seems to be different. I guess if you want to say that they're the same, you could say that um, both relationships begin with something else rather than the person themselves. So like uh, the first relationship with Edith began uh, with her presentation of herself, not her actual self. And the relationship with Catherine began with her dissertation and only gradually uh, came back to Catherine, the person. But you know, I think most relationships are like that. There has to be a point of entry because you know, most of us don't walk around presenting our true selves, whatever that means, everywhere we go, right? We always behave differently and say things differently according to different situations and uh, with different people according to context. So the beginning of any romantic relationship or intimate relationship, I think always has to begin with some kind of entry point, something that uh, lets two people interact without all of a sudden just talking about their deepest feelings. Because like if a stranger walks up to you on the street and talks about their deepest feelings to you, you're probably going to think they're crazy. So um, that is something similar between these two relationships, but I think it's something that applies to all intimate relationships. Uh, so it's not a particularly relevant similarity. Uh, OK, question three. Well, actually, no, we can take a closer look at this in chapter 13. Um, or is it chapter 12? Hang on. Um, no, 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 that was that's when they first sleep with each other. That's the end of chapter 12. Chapter 13. Yeah, chapter 13. Uh, let's see. Page 198 to 199. Let's look at page 199. That was one of the oddities of what they called given opinion that they learned that summer. Given opinion today we would call conventional wisdom what people usually believe. They had been brought up in a tradition 
that told them in one way or another that the life of the mind and the life of the senses or the body were separate and indeed inimical. Inimical, inimical means enemies. It's the from the same root, right? Can you see this enemy enemy? They are enemies. They're opposed to each other. They had believed without ever having really thought about it that one had to be chosen at some expense of the other. So you could either lead a life of the mind and, and of thinking, or you can lead a life of the senses and enjoyment. That the one could intensify the other had never occurred to them. And since the embodiment came before the recognition of the truth, it seemed a discovery that belonged to them alone. So because they experienced it before they recognized it, so they first experienced how being physically in love also helped them think more clearly and, and be more aware. And they experienced this before they understood this is what is happening. So it seemed like a discovery that belonged to them alone. They began to collect these oddities of given opinion. And they hoarded them as if they were treasures. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say, which is that um, their relationship is also including the life of the mind. In fact, the previous paragraph, starting from the end of 198, uh, tells us this very clearly. Sometimes they would lift their eyes from their studies, smile at each other and return to their reading. Uh, sometimes in the middle of reading, he would appreciate her beauty uh, and then they would start making love again. And then afterwards, they would return to their studies. So the life of the body and the life of the mind are mixed together and in fact intensify each other. So their relationship is also based on this uh, intellectual bond or connection. OK, next question. Why do you think Stoner's affair improves his family life? And do you think this might be a general phenomenon? Why or why not? Uh, so. We see that. On the bottom of page 199. Oh, the bottom of page 199 is. This paragraph. It was a relationship that, according to given opinion, ought to have worsened steadily as what given opinion would describe as his affair went on. So he's talking about his relationship with Edith and Grace. According to conventional wisdom, the deeper he fell in love with Catherine, the worse his family relationship should have been. But it did no such thing. On the contrary, it seems steadily to improve. His lengthening absences away from what he still had to call his home seemed to bring him closer to both Edith and Grace than he had been in years. He began to have for Edith a curious friendliness that was close to affection. And they even talked together now and then of nothing in particular. Ah, they started to actually chat like friends. Uh, this is important, right? If if your conversation with someone is only about things that you have to take care of or things that have to be done in your life, like practical things. God, that's a boring conversation. That's a boring relationship. Um, so the fact that he's able to chat with Edith about nothing in particular shows an improvement in their relationship. And it's not just on his part. During that summer, she even cleaned the glassed in sun porch, had repaired the damage done by the weather and put a day bed there so that he no longer had to sleep on the living room couch. And sometimes on weekends, she made calls upon neighbors, so she visited neighbors and left Grace alone with her father. Huh? So they both seem to behave better to each other and the relationship improves. Isn't that strange? Um, so why do you think this happens? 
Well, I think we can begin by talking from Edith's point of view. Remember, we mentioned how Edith seems not to hate Stoner the person, but to hate the fact that she had to. Uh, she believes that she has to obey this man in her house, even though she married in order to get away from another man, her father. Well, now that Stoner has an affair and is staying away from home longer and longer, she no longer has to uh, worry about following him or obeying him. Because first of all, he's not there. And secondly, he's behaving not like a proper husband. So perhaps Edith feels that she doesn't need to behave like a proper wife, like the pressure is weaker there. So maybe that's why she behaves better to him. Because we know that she actually does know about Stoner's affair. Um, and what about Stoner's part? Well, no, we can continue looking at Edith's part. Uh, so we learn that she knows about the affair because at the bottom of page 200, the top of page the top of page 201. She says, uh, you know, Stoner, you're late or Bill, you're late. Uh, and he goes, wait, what, what do you mean late? And Edith said, won't your little co-ed be angry if you keep her waiting? Now the word co-ed means female student. This is because colleges at first only allowed male students. When uh, women were first allowed into college, they were kept in a separate part of the school. So like in Harvard, uh, women were put into Rad Radcliffe College, which is a college specifically for the women. Um, but as time went on, people started realizing that this was unfair to the women and also created too much trouble for teachers who had to teach the same thing twice. So uh, they started letting women join men's classes. So they were co-educated, educated together. So even today, the word co-ed means a female college student. Um, technically, yes, Catherine is still a student. Perhaps we forget this because uh, she was uh, also said to be a teacher. And calling her a co-ed, though, is kind of insulting. Because as a PhD student, it doesn't really matter what classes you take or who you study with because your research is your own. The research and, and studies that you should care about are your own, so you're not really being educated with anyone. It's yourself. So calling her co-ed um, is like calling her an undergraduate. It's kind of insulting. Uh, and the way the reason Edith calls her a co-ed is you notice that there is a sharpness in her voice. Maybe she's not feeling very happy this morning. And she's taking out her anger on Stoner and his uh, mistress. Uh, and Edith says, did you think I didn't know about your little flirtation? Or I guess there's a pause here, right? I, did you think I didn't know about your little flirtation? Why, I've known it all along. So he's shocked and uh, he tries to defend himself. There's no flirtation as you call it. It's. Now this is interesting. What do you think he would have said to complete this sentence? Because it's true. There is no flirtation. It's just a really serious relationship. Do you think that's what he was going to say? It's just pure intense love? Not quite sure. So I think it's very clever of the novel to interrupt him right here because there's no real way for him to finish this sentence. Anyway, Edith interrupts him, calls him Willie and says, oh, I know all about these things. A man your age and all. It's natural, I suppose. At least they say it is. So Edith doesn't seem to be offended. Uh, and the reason she gives is because 
this is to be expected at this point in a marriage. Like it's not guaranteed to happen, but maybe like it, it happens often enough that she shouldn't be surprised. But again, remember Edith is a person of presentation. This is what she tells Stoner, but then when Stoner says if you want to talk about this, she says no. There was an edge of fear in her voice. There's nothing to talk about, nothing at all. So there's an edge of fear in her voice. What is she afraid of? Maybe I think uh, this is related to what we were just talking about, how Edith is sort of like a bit happy that Stoner is not around the house all the time, that he's not so focused on her as his wife. So maybe she's afraid that if they talk about it and he ends his affair, um, things will return to the terrible situation that there was before. Or in the other direction, maybe she's afraid that if they talk about it and he decides to leave her, uh, she would end up in a terrible financial situation like we talked about last week and the week before. So the best thing for Edith is to preserve the status quo, to keep things exactly as they are right now. Uh, and so talking about it is not a good idea for her because talk can only lead to change. OK, but what about Stoner? Why do you think Stoner, uh, his behavior and his attitude toward family life improves with his affair. Well, on the one hand, something similar happens, right? He doesn't have to care so much about his own house life, his own home life. It's uh, it takes some pressure off of his relationship with Edith if it's not his most important personal relationship. He doesn't have to worry too much about her. He doesn't have to care too much about uh, her, how she behaves. His focus can be elsewhere. On Catherine. And also, secondly, he does spend less time at home, so uh, he doesn't have to put up with Edith that often, doesn't have to take her abuse. Um, but we can also look at. Um, Let's see. We can also look at how the affair changes him. Uh, let's see if I can find this. I should have put in a page number here. Um, maybe it's on page 197. No. OK, let me let me search for this. I really needed a page number. Oh, huh. Beginning of chapter 13. Um, so this is after uh, Stoner sleeps with her for the first time. So this is describing like the beginning of their relationship. Uh, yeah, so end of first paragraph. He used to think, so this is interesting, the evolution of his idea of love. In his extreme youth, Stoner had thought of love as an absolute state of being to which if one were lucky, one might find access. So if you're lucky enough to be in love, you would be in the condition called in love, and that's what you would be. That's it. In his maturity, after he grew up, he had decided it was the heaven of a false religion toward which one ought to gaze with an amused disbelief, a gently familiar contempt and an embarrassed nostalgia. So after he grows up, he does not believe in love anymore. And when he hears about someone in love, uh, it, along with the disbelief and the contempt, 
he would also feel nostalgia because he also once believed that love existed. But now in his middle age, he began to know that it was neither a state of grace nor an illusion. He saw it as a human act of becoming. A condition that was invented and modified moment by moment and day by day by the will and the intelligence and the heart. So love is not a static, unchanging status or condition. It is ever changing, modified moment by moment. So it is an act of becoming, of turning into something. And turning into what? Turning into a human being. Uh, that a, this kind of romantic love, this kind of true loving relationship is one of those things that makes us human and that because we have to change every day along with our partner, uh, it makes us human every day. Like, what does it mean to be human? I mean, I know this is a big question, uh, but one possible answer could be to be human is to be human with other humans. So it's a social definition, the way that you behave with other people, right? In Chinese, we also say this, right? Uh, he's not human, like he doesn't behave properly. So if that's the case, then a romantic relationship is essentially behaving with another person, like the most pure, intense kind of behaving with another person. So if it's truly that kind of relationship, then what it does is it produces two humans, two people who are always incredibly uh, tightly connected and attuned to the other person, always aware of the other person, always adjusting to the other person. It's a fully human relationship. So if we understand Stoner's affair in this sense, that it makes him more human. That helps us to understand his improving home life. Uh, it helps him to behave more like a human to Edith and while at home as well. Previously, he was mostly just putting up with Edith's abuse, uh, staying on campus as long as he can. Um, but he's not really engaging with or dealing with or interacting with Edith as a human being. But maybe because this relationship makes him more human, he also starts uh, being able to interact with Edith with more human feeling as well. And that improves their home life a bit. Uh, so the second part of the question, do you think this might be a general phenomenon? Why or why not? So what this question is asking is, do you think that uh, in general, when someone has an affair, their home life also improves? I think the answer here is probably um, it depends on what kind of affair, right? If it's an affair, um, that's simply based on sex, then probably not. Because what's happening here is uh, that Stoner and Catherine have that true connection from human to human. But if someone is having an affair just for sex, that's not really a relationship. That's just an activity. Um, there's a famous quote by the French. Why is this to here? There's a famous quote by the French psychoanalyst uh, Jacques Lacan, who said there is no sexual relation. In other words, uh, in the act of sex, there is no relation. You are simply pursuing your own pleasure and desire along with the other person. Like you two are using each other for pleasure and desire. There's no actual relationship there. So that kind of affair I don't think would improve home life. Um, well, of course, it does still depend if the home life, if at home the adulterous person was not having a satisfying sexual life, 
then maybe the cheater um, would be made happier and more satisfied with a sexual affair outside the home. And in that case, maybe it would improve home life in that uh, home uh, a life with someone else is always improved when the people involved are satisfied or even happy. Or another way to say this is if you're unhappy, it's very common that you would spread your unhappiness to the people around you. So if you're happy and satisfied, it might make for a better and improved home life. Uh, so we see that the answer to this question is basically. Um, I think there are two parts, right? So first of all, the person who is cheating, are they cheating in order to get something that they need that they can't get from their home life? And the person who is being cheated on, so in this case, Edith, um, do they need more space or distance from their cheating spouse or cheating partner? Because sometimes it is true that relationships uh, can fall apart because of a lack of space or a lack of distance. Like this is one of the fundamental uh, paradoxes of a romantic or intimate relationship. The two people form a relationship with each other and create something entirely new. But at the same time, they are each still individual people. And we know that people sometimes need some space and time to themselves. So if the two, if the couple always spends all of their time together, then they're lacking that kind of personal space and personal time. But of course, if they only spend all their time by themselves, then there's no real relationship between them. So uh, an intimate relationship sort of depends on striking a balance between these two. Uh, spending time with your partner and spending time away from your partner and knowing when is the right time, what are the right reasons, and understanding the times and the reasons of your partner as well, right? Not just you, but also the other person in the relationship. That's what makes um, this kind of relationship fully human. The fact that you care about the other person enough to respect when they need their own personal time and personal space. Uh, if you don't have that personal time and space, the relationship can become possessive. Uh, in Chinese, we call this yu zan yu yu, right? You always have to be uh, with me. I can't let you go by yourself. Very unhealthy. Um, so a healthy relationship strikes a balance between these two. So if someone has an affair and they are able to get something they d can't get from their home life, and the other person can get more space and time to themselves that they feel like they need, then it, that kind of affair could also uh, result in an improved home life. But you'll realize that there are a lot of conditions here, right? A lot of things that have to be true in order for this to happen. Uh, and I'm pretty sure most affairs don't satisfy all of these conditions, don't meet all of the requirements. Um, so it's probably not a general phenomenon. It's probably kind of rare. Who knows? Never tried it. Not going to try it. I hope you don't try it either. Next question. What time is it? OK, we have time. Next question. Why do you think it's most important for Stoner and Catherine to still be themselves after the affair? Do you agree why or why not? So this is on page 214, 215. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find this. Um, so they are. This is like their last meeting, I believe. 
And so they finally have to face the fact that the affair must end. And so they're trying to come to terms with the ending of their affair, trying to make sense of it, trying to get out of the affair uh, with as cleanly and healthily as they can for themselves and for the other person. Uh, so the final bit of fantasy, Stoner said calmly, if I threw it all away, if I gave it up, just walked out, you would go with me, wouldn't you? Yes, she said. But you know I won't do that, don't you? Yes, I know. Because then, Stoner explained to himself. And he's explaining to himself because Catherine already says, yes, I know. So she understands. Stoner is explaining to himself. But really, he's explaining to the reader. Right, the novel says explain to himself, but this is the novel talking to us. So why won't he do it? Because then none of it would mean anything. Nothing we have done, nothing we have been. I almost certainly wouldn't be able to teach and you, you would become something else. We both would become something else, something other than ourselves. We would be nothing. Nothing, she said. And we have to come out of this at least with ourselves. Uh, OK, so let's take a look at this part first and then we'll continue. So obviously he wouldn't be able to teach. She wouldn't be able to get her degree and have to do something else. Uh, we talked about this when talking about Walker. If he is prevented from finishing his studies, he would have to find a completely different job. And this would also happen to Catherine. Uh, Stoner too, he wouldn't be able to teach. They would have to do something completely different. Therefore, they would become something else, something other than ourselves. That's the first way to understand this. But there's another way. Um, in the long run, Stoner said, it isn't Edith or even Grace or the certainty of losing Grace that keeps me here. It isn't the scandal or the hurt to you or me. It isn't the hardship we would have to go through or even the loss of love we might have to face. It's simply the destruction of ourselves, of what we do. I know, Catherine said. So we are of the world after all. We should have known that. We did know it, I believe, but we had to withdraw a little, pretend a little so that we could um, so we see that here when he says the destruction of ourselves and he says up here, we know that we are what we are. I mean, yes, getting a new career and everything would be changing oneself, but a destruction of oneself. This is kind of extreme. I think he, he appears to be saying that in this relationship, they have truly found themselves. They truly see who they are. And if they ran away together, the relationship would no longer be the same, right? Their relationship now is defined against the world, right? They have to sneak away and take time away from everything else in the world that is asking for their time and attention. So that's why he says, so we are of the world after all. This relationship cannot last forever because they have to be part of the world. So if they do run away together, they would no longer have the same relationship. Their relationship would then be a relationship in the world and it would be completely different. Uh, not like taking t secret intimate moments away from the world together, not just reading studying and making love and then studying again. They would have to deal with things like getting another job, paying the bills, uh, actually living a life together, not just spending moments together with each other. In fact, we can say that this is kind of the difference between uh, uh, like boyfriend, girlfriend and uh, marriage. I'm talking not about like long term boyfriend, girlfriend where you're already living together and whatever, but I mean like that original burst of passionate romance versus marriage and long term life together. Uh, 
the first is outside the world because the two lovers are creating their own world. But the second one, marriage is part of the world. All right, marriage is defined by law, by society. Um, so that's why it's most important for them to still be themselves after the affair. Because if they gave up everything in order to continue their relationship, they wouldn't even have the relationship. So if they can't have the relationship, then it it's most important that they still have themselves, that they are still complete of themselves. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Um, so like they have a choice, right? Stay together or break up. If they stay together, uh, they would be losing themselves because they have to change themselves for the relationship. But they would also be losing the relationship because it would be transformed into a different relationship. So they can only choose to break up. But since they're breaking up and they're not uh, keeping the relationship anyway, then the only thing they have left is themselves. So it's very important that in this process of separating, they keep themselves uh, complete. They keep themselves as they are uh, to themselves, that they keep knowing what they are, what um, and maintain themselves. Uh, do you agree? Yes, why I wrote the question. OK, let's take a short break and remember I'm still recording during the break. Do you have questions? You can ask me questions now. No questions. OK, break.
OK, we're back. So the last question. What do you think of Stoner's affair in general? Do you think it's a good thing, bad thing or something else? And do you think there might be a connection to how he gets his regular teaching schedule back? Why or why not? So I think we talked a lot, a lot already about Stoner's affair. Um, the novel seems to portray this affair as a good thing. Or I guess as an important thing. Um, even the negative parts like the danger to his reputation, the pain of separation at the end, and like the illness that he has at the beginning of chapter 14. Uh, those seem to be worth the costs that are worth paying in order to get the good parts, which is the whole new level of human uh, being. So yeah, looks like a good thing. So uh, this might change some of your ideas about marriage or about faithfulness in marriage. But as we talked about, most affairs probably don't have such a good result. Um, so I guess we th what the thing to say here is that human relationships are complicated and unique. And so you shouldn't um, judge people simply according to conventional wisdom, what people usually say. So for example, on page 218, um, here, um, Edith again asks him what is his mistress's name. Stoner says Catherine Driscoll. Edith says, oh yes, Catherine Driscoll. Well, you see, I told you, didn't I? I told you these things weren't important. My God, how painful it must be for Stoner to hear her say this. After everything he went through, after everything he went through, not just during the relationship, but after breaking up with her, uh, she says it's not important, right? This is the the pain and the hurt that conventional wisdom can cause. Because that is why Edith says this, right? This is the conventional wisdom. A middle aged guy has a younger girlfriend, fucks around and then leaves her and everything goes back to normal. That's what people usually think. But Stoner's personal experience is so different. And to use conventional wisdom to explain it is so painful that it's almost an insult to him and to his uh, the memory of their relationship. Um, and so the final part of the question, do you think there might be a connection to how he gets his regular schedule back? Why or why not? I got to be honest with you. Chapter 14 is my favorite chapter of the book. It's so hilarious, um, but also kind of sad. We read how um, after Stoner recovers from his fever, he becomes a crusty old guy. He, he's not very polite. Uh, and the only time he really shows any care and attention is when he is meeting with his composition students uh, and helping them learn how to write. Everything else is just, it, he turns uh, gaunt. Gaunt means thin and skinny, like tired and harsh and crusty and does not have tact or diplomacy has ill temper. So let's see. Uh, so yes, first he aged rapidly. He seldom spoke to anyone except his students. This is on page 218. Um, and where is it? Here. He developed a reputation for crustiness and ill temper. Um, but 
he with his young students, he was gentle and patient. Though he demanded of them more work than they were willing to give. With an impersonal firmness that was hard for many of them to understand. Uh, so they, the students can't understand why he insists so much that they do perfect work. Um, and I think first of all, you know, it's it's not wrong for a teacher to ask his or her students to do better work than they can. Um, I think it's only wrong if if like they punish the students or get angry at the students uh, for doing something that they are unable to do. But I think teachers should always give students uh, a goal that is just out of reach so that students always have something to work toward and to work for. Um, we can also pay attention to some of the other interesting psychological observations here. He did his work with the doggedness and resolve that amused his older colleagues and enraged the younger instructors who, like himself, taught only freshman composition. So he only teaches freshman composition, but he teaches it so uh, intensely. He pays so much attention to it. Doggedness means persistence or not just persistence, but like a plodding um, kind of putting one foot in front of the other, keeping on going no matter what happens. Um, maybe not even for smart reasons, but simply like a stubborn persistence. Yeah, that's what doggedness means to be dogged. And resolve, of course, means determination. This attitude amuses his older colleagues because they're thinking like, oh, it's just freshman composition. Why are you so serious? But it enrages the younger instructors. Why? Well, the novel tells us that they also only teach freshman composition. So this is supposed to be the job of the younger instructors. And here we have this older stoner who teaches the same thing, but he does it so seriously and with such dedication and determination. Um, so it's not even what he's supposed to do, but he does it so well that it maybe we can say that it makes the younger instructors look bad, it makes them look lazy. Um, and that's why they're angry. Stoner spent hours marking and correcting freshman themes, and he had student conferences every day. So here theme means topic, the topic for a com composition. Uh, so by theme, it means essays. Um, so continuing on page 219, he is considered a dedicated teacher a term they used half in envy and half in contempt. One whose dedication blinded him to anything that went on outside the classroom or at the most outside the halls of the university. Uh, and here's a, a good joke. Uh, someone once complained that copy to stoner copulation is restricted to verbs. So if you don't know what we usually call the B verb, right? am, is, be, are. In grammar, these are called the copula, which means that they connect. Uh, they connect the first, the word before with the word after. So like, I am a teacher. The am connects me and teacher and tells you that these two are connected, um, even the same thing. Uh, but copulation also means sex. So when this young instructor makes this joke, uh, he was surprised at the quality of laughter and meaningful looks exchanged by some of the older men, the older colleagues who still remember Stoner's affair. Um, and here's another joke that's also very interesting. Someone else said, old Stoner thinks that WPA stands for wrong pronoun antecedent. 
So a wrong pronoun antecedent means. Um, uh, for a, a verb. It has to match the subject, and if the subject is a pronoun, uh, then it has to be grammatically. It has to fit the verb. So if a verb is a plural like uh, teach, not teaches, but just teach, then the subject has to be he, uh, sorry, they and not he or she, because it would be he teaches or she teaches, but they teach. So that's a wrong pronoun antecedent. The, the interesting part is the WPA. What does WPA actually usually stand for? It stands for the Works Progress Administration. This is a government agency created by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Roosevelt in the 1930s in response to the Great Depression. So this is when uh, the economy was terrible in the late 1920s early uh, and early to mid 1930s. People were losing their homes and uh, everyone was losing their money. Farms are collapsing, banks were collapsing. It was just a terrible economy. The government had the idea that it was the responsibility of the government to make sure that the uh, people had as much opportunity to work for money as they could. So one thing that President Roosevelt did was create the Works Progress Administration uh, to uh, create projects for artists and writers and creative people um, so that they would have work and would not starve during the Great Depression. And this was a big political issue. As you can imagine, just like today, society in the 1930s did not think that artists were very important, or at least were not important enough that the government should spend tax money to keep artists employed and give them jobs and money. Many people thought this was waste. Um, and there was also a question of uh, the influence of communism. The US is really afraid of communism. They're afraid that working class people will unite and rise up against ca the capitalist owners of companies and, and government. Um, and so the idea that the government would be creating jobs in order to keep artists alive, artists who could not survive a market economy, seem to many people to be a communist idea. Taking people's money using taxes and then giving them to artists who could not survive without government help. Uh, because remember, the US is a capitalist economy, so they. On the surface, at least uh, they believe that the market determines everything. And if you can't survive on the market, you have to change in order to fit the market better. So this entire idea of the Works Progress Administration was very controversial. And of course, President Roosevelt did lots of other controversial things too. So this WPA thing got tied to all of his other controversial things. Um, and so that's why this is an interesting joke because it tells us the year or the time that this is taking place, the 1930s, early 1930s. Um, there was recently a documentary film that came out demonstrating that actually most of the important artists and writers of the mid to late 20th century all got their start uh, many of them got their start because of WPA money. So, and this documentary shows the importance of government funding for the arts because these artists that the government kept alive weren't just making art at that time. They also made art later after or during and after Second World War and made art and wrote literature that was incredibly important and influential in later years. 
Um, so yeah, so the WPA is still an important discussion today, especially in these times when uh, during the pandemic uh, countries are locking down and opening up and locking down and opening up. Uh, and people really need money for jobs uh, to uh, need jobs for money, but jobs may not uh, be the kind of jobs that they want during a pandemic. Um, like service jobs, like uh, being a waiter. Uh, not a good idea when you're in a pandemic. That kind of thing. So the responsibility of government to keep its people alive. Uh, you will have people talking about what kind of people should the government support? How much should the government support them? What, a, what is the value of these people for society? These kinds of questions. So the, the WPA is at the center of a debate that is still happening today. Um, and so after the affair, he his uh, stoner's personality returns to the knowledge of hardship and hunger and endurance and pain from his childhood. Uh, from his own farm and from the farm of his relatives. So all of this gossip, all of these like rumors, they don't touch him. He he knows in his heart that these are not important. Um, and this next section is about the Great Depression. We're going to skip that because I just talked about it. Uh, and then here we have the beginning of World War II. Now in East Asia, the beginning of World War II was in 1937 when Japan invaded China. But in Europe, uh, it's usually thought of as 1939 when Hitler invaded Poland. No, when Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, Czechu. Um, but really many people think of the beginning of this period of history as beginning in 1936 uh, when Franco rebelled against the Spanish government. Um, so I don't know how much you know about the Spanish Civil War in Spain, but Franco was the first fascist, not Hitler, well, I guess no, like Mussolini was the first fascist. But Franco was the first fascist, fascist to start a war. Um, at the time, the Spanish government, I think, was uh, a democratic republic. And Franco rebelled. He's a general. He took his uh, army and rebelled and wanted to uh, remake Spain into a Catholic uh, authoritarian government. And um, this was a really important civil war because everyone at the time knew that fascism was becoming a problem. So when uh, Franco started his rebellion as a fascist rebellion, many, many people who were not Spanish went to Spain to fight for the Republic. Uh, and they lost. Um, so this is actually can be seen as the first major European battle of the Second World War, even though it's only a civil war within the country of Spain alone. So with this event, the novel now brings us to World War II. Uh, and then we finally have the comparison between Stoner and Sloan that we have been waiting for for a long time. When the novel describes Stoner as older and gaunt and impolite and things like that, I kept thinking about how similar this was to um, Archer Sloan in Sloan's later years. Well, anyways, here we have a more direct comparison. Stoner realized, like Archer Sloan, the futility and waste of committing oneself wholly to the irrational and dark forces that impelled the world toward its unknown end. Basically, the futility of joining a war. Um, so
So just like Sloan, Stoner withdrew a little distance to pity and love, so he was not caught in the rushing that he observed. Uh, but unlike Archer Sloan, he looked again to the cautious faith that was embodied in the institution of the university. So you, we remember how Sloan was like, there are other battles than military battles. There are other wars than fighting wars. And he was talking about the war against ignorance, the building up of civilization. This is something that the university is at the center of. So Stoner remembers how Sloan lost his will to life uh, because of the despair at how everyone wanted to join World War I. So in order to avoid that despair, Stoner tried to find faith in something else, and the faith that he found was in the university as a bastion, a stronghold of intellectualism and civilization. Um, so that's his response to World War II. Um, so all of these things are in his mind uh, when he fights back for his classes. Uh, and I'm not going to go through this, but basically what he does is he decides to teach his freshman composition class as if it were a medieval English literature class. And nothing can stop. Nobody can stop him. It's his class. He is a professor with tenure. Nobody can uh, fire him. Nobody can tell him how to teach, um, which is not exactly the same as today, right? If I teach this class in a very strange way, you're probably going to complain to the office and I'll have to change. But back in uh, when the university was not as common, when there were fewer college students, the professors had more authority to do whatever they want, basically. So he teaches his composition course like a medieval literature course. Uh, and he threatens to. Uh, in the next semester to teach an even harder course under the name of composition. So Lomax is forced to let him teach an actual medieval literature course in order to prevent rebellion from the composition students. Um, and that's how he gets his courses back. So the question here is, could there be a connection to his affair? Well, uh, in the sense that everything in life is influenced by everything that happened before, then yes, there is a, a connection. And the connection is in how after the end of the affair, Stoner got the fever and then he became an older man who didn't care about anything. And he started to realize that simply not caring is not enough because not caring does not let him uh, maintain his sanity and faith in the face of the Second World War. So as he regains, he, he seeks and finds a new faith in the university. Uh, and this faith lets him find the courage and um, the, the idea, the inspiration of how to regain his intellectual passion and the courses that he wants to teach. So the, the way that he gains back his regular teaching schedule is two parts. First, the end of the affair reminds him that most things are unimportant and he doesn't have to care about most things. So for example, he doesn't have to care about Lomax's reaction when he decides to teach medieval English as composition or composition as medieval English. The second part is that because of the Second World War, he realizes that he does need to fight for something. He can't just not care about anything. And the thing that he fights for is the university and what the university symbolizes. Intellectualism, civilization, learning. In other words, not just teaching composition because 
your enemy makes you, but to actually fight for the chance to teach something that you think truly matters. And for stoner, that is medieval English. So yeah, there's a connection here, not a big one, but there is a connection. OK, so up to this point, do you have questions? Um, in the lecture, I mentioned that the students are all know about the legend of the fight between Stoner and um, Lomax. Sorry, that happens in the next chapter at the beginning of next chapter. Uh, so I was skipping ahead a little bit. Anyway, questions? OK, if you don't have questions, let's jump back to the beginning of chapter 12 and take a um, closer look at um, this selection. I'm looking for chapter 12 in my book. OK. Ah, thank you, Brittany. Yes, no questions. So chapter 12. Um, so this is building on the end of the previous chapter where he's like walking through the winter. Uh, sorry, no, he's sitting in his office and he feels himself float away into the winter. And so this chapter begins during that year and especially in the winter months, he found himself returning more and more frequently to such a state of unreality. This is page 181. At will, he seemed able to remove his consciousness from the body that contained it, and he observed himself as if he were an oddly familiar stranger doing the oddly familiar things that he had to do. Um, so he starts to feel right at this point, he has lost all his wars at home and in his university department. So he doesn't have a sense of belonging in the world anymore. So that's why he more and more often feels unreal, like he's floating away. There's nothing in his life at this moment to keep him grounded in his life. Um, let's skip ahead. Um, so the scene where he meets, where Catherine asks him to read the dissertation. Page 182, the way that this scene begins already kind of tells you how it's going to end. Well, how it's going to develop, because at this moment, a pile of freshman themes or compositions lay on his desk. He was not looking at it. He gazed out the window. He was like daydreaming. He's not doing his work. Uh, so Catherine comes in, asks him to read the dissertation, give her some suggestions. Uh, and like now that we know they have an affair, you can go back and look at their earlier interactions and you can kind of tell that she likes Stoner, the way that she behaves toward him. Um, and here too, right? She gazed at him for a moment. This is on page 183. She gazed at him for a moment. Uh, and her face was extraordinarily pale, so maybe she's nervous. Uh, she sits down. Stoner stared at her for a moment uh, and then realized he was staring and so uh, began to talk to her. Small talk. But she spoke abruptly, suddenly. Um, and to, to bring up the real reason she's here, which is to ask him to read through her dissertation. Uh, and when he said, I thought you would be further along than this. So in other words, she's been a student here for so long. He thought her work would currently be longer than it is. 
And she says it was I was, but I started over. Uh, and we later learn why she starts over. Uh, and when he asks when she needs it back, she says any time, whenever you can get around to it. To me, that seems like very polite because if I were a student and I have been a student uh, and I needed advice on my work, like I would hope that um, I could get it back soon so that I can continue. And also because like teachers are busy, man. Like I've known some professors who took like a week to reply to an email. No, I know a professor who told me straight to my face. He does not check his email. Uh, that's how busy he is. So like. Here, let me see if I can find this. This is I found something really crazy about this. Ah, Someone has a question. Does someone have a question? No, no questions. OK, um, let me see if I can find this. Not that one. Not that one. Jeez. Uh, uh, no, not that one. Gosh, so there was a comic explaining how so there was a comic where uh, the author asked a survey of professors um, how many unread emails are in your inbox and there were actually professors who responded over like 10,000 unread emails in their inbox. Like that's just crazy to me. Oh, I know why this is the wrong comic. Other comic. This one. Uh, so you'll see out of it says here 9000 people who responded on Twitter to this survey. There are 14% of people who have over 10,000 unread emails in their inbox. Over 10,000 like so when when I say teachers are busy, teachers are busy, yo. Uh, so. When uh, Catherine ask Stoner to read something for her. If I were Catherine, I would set a deadline just to remind him. Uh, not necessarily like actually wanting Stoner to return it to me by the deadline, but just to give him like a time frame. Uh, but Stoner is very considerate, so uh, he gives her a, time, a deadline himself this Friday. So he has one week. Or no, less than a week. That was on a Tuesday. So now I'm on page 184. And for some reason, for reasons that he did not fully understand, he could not bring himself to open the folder to begin the reading. He watched it warily, carefully, as if it were an enemy that was trying to entice him again into a war that he had renounced. So at, by this point, remember, he's been teaching freshman composition only. And he's no longer doing research, right? His book got published and he wasn't doing research. So he's kind of scared. Like I've already accepted that my research passions are not going to be used. And here is an opportunity for me to re-engage those passions. What if I never have another chance again? What if this is the last time? Then like after I'm finished helping her with this dissertation, I would once again have to face the fact that nobody wants to me to do research, that nobody cares about my passion. It's the same logic some people say when they say like after like their pet dies, they say I'm never going to get another pet again because it's so painful to lose a pet. 
it's the same logic. Uh, but anyways, he had uh, promised her that he would read it. Uh, but he kept he kept he keeps on putting it off. And yet when he finally goes to the library to read it. An empty carol, a library carol is simply a seat for you in the library for you to read things. You know, like those big tables that are divided and then each have a light on top. That's a carol. Um, even when he starts reading, he had a hard time making himself look at the pages. I'm on page 185. Um, and then finally he can't put it off and he actually starts paying attention. This description is very interesting. At first, only a nervous edge of his mind touched what he read. So he's not using his full brain power. But gradually the words forced themselves upon him. He frowned and read more carefully. And then he was caught. He turned back to where he had begun and his attention flowed upon the page. So finally his attention is caught by this passion for research. And so he uses this, his full brain power, his newfound passion or regained passion to begin again and to read the whole thing. My God, he said to himself in a kind of wonder. And his fingers trembled with excitement as he turned the pages. Because they are going in directions that he himself had only dimly glimpsed. So this is real cutting edge research. This is real innovative original research. It's very valuable in uh, academia to find research that is truly new and original and important. Uh, so after he finishes, he leans back in happy exhaustion. Uh, and he, he was so engrossed in the reading that he did not notice the time. Have you ever had that experience? You're so engrossed in doing something that you did not notice the time. And like for some of you that may be playing video games, but even when you're playing video games, it's more like you, you keep on being attracted to the next round, to the next battle. You want to get it right. You want to win the next one. Uh, but here I'm talking about a, a status where it's the same activity. You're not like in a hurry to get to the next thing. But the, the doing of this activity itself is so engrossing, draws so much of your attention that you don't notice the time has passed. You don't realize you're spending so much time. It's like uh, doing this is the thing that makes you happy in life. And when you finally suddenly feel tired and you have to stop and you look up, it's already 2 a.m. That kind of thing. It could be anything. It could be reading a good book or writing a good book. Uh, it could be playing music. Could be, um, you know, exercising. I once had a girlfriend who uh, found this uh, status and emotion when she was painting. Um, so that's the kind of situation that Stoner finds himself in. He's so drawn to this research that he does not notice the outside world. And then so he rushes back to his office and he notices the office, the main office secretary, right? The main office department office. The secretary is a new girl that Lomax had recently hired. So. Stoner is basically like. The entire department has been oriented against him. Even the secretary is Lomax's person. Gosh, how terrible it must be. Um, so anyways, he, he rushes to return the dissertation to Catherine. Bottom of 186. Again, notice her reaction. He, he shows up at her door. And like uh, notice how she's dressed, right? Her hair is up. Uh, and 
he could see her ears. She's wearing dark rimmed glasses, which are usually considered not fashionable. Like today, when we talk about like thick rimmed glasses as fashionable, it's fashionable because fashion today is often uh, what used to be unfashionable before. Like fashion comes in cycles. What was out before is in now. What is in now will be out later. Uh, so at the time, this was considered not fashionable. She was startled by his appearance. She's not expecting him. She had on a mannish shirt open at the neck, and she was wearing dark slacks. Slacks are the, the pants that you would wear with a suit. By the way, shirt. Uh, shirt, the word shirt actually means a button up shirt. Uh, so in Chinese, this is cen san. And that's why uh, we have the word T-shirt because it's a different kind of shirt. The original shirt word is the shirt that you have to button up and it's long sleeves. That's a shirt. So she's wearing a shirt like that and uh, dark slacks that made her appear slimmer and more graceful than he remembered her. So Stoner finally notices her physical beauty. Um, Actually, from the way that she's dressed, we can kind of assume that maybe she had just been teaching. Or, you know, maybe not. Who knows? OK, her reaction. For several moments, she did not speak. She looked at him expressionlessly and bit her lower lip. She moved back from the door. Won't you come in? So she invites Stoner inside. Uh, you know, if she wanted to, she could have just taken the manuscript, said thank you, and then like went back inside. But she invites him inside. She wants to have uh, further interactions with him. And also this, she bites her lower lip. OK, this is a thing that many uh, male authors use to show that a woman is interested in someone, especially a romantic interest. I'm not exactly sure how often women actually do this when they see someone they're interested in, but apparently it's something that uh, many men think is a sign of interest. Like if they see a woman biting their lip uh, when they look at them, when the woman looks at the man, the man sometimes will think that the woman is interested in him. And maybe it's true, but maybe I don't think it's true for every woman. It's one of those things in fiction that, um, you know, fiction is not exactly like real life. And some of the things that are in fiction that are not part of real life are there as a kind of signal to tell you this is what's happening. This is one of those signals. Uh, if, if you see a woman character biting her lower lip, she is romantically attracted to another person. Another kind of this kind of signal that you might see is if in the middle of the night or maybe not even in the middle of the night, if the novel says he heard a dog barking. What this means is it's very quiet and time is passing. Because if it's quiet and time is passing, you can't really show that time is passing by having people do things because they're quiet and they're not actually doing anything. So you have to have something to show that time is passing. And many many writers will use a dog barking in the distance. So if you hear a dog barking in the distance, it, it's a sign that time is passing. If you see a woman biting her lower lip, it's a sign that she's interested in this other person. It does not mean it's real. It's, it's just something that happens in not in fiction. Um, so from this, we can tell that she is interested in him. Uh, and so, you know, they enter. And because it's a small place, they are very close. So he has entered her personal space. And after the discussion, his voice took on an urgency that he could not understand. So when he's urging her, you must continue with this research, don't give up. He, he himself does not really understand why he's speaking so urgently. But we know it's because it's been such a long time 
since he has cared about research. It's such a precious and valuable thing to him that he he he's uh, he treats it as such a precious and valuable thing that if Catherine were to give it up, he would be devastated. So he is urgently telling her, don't give up. You must finish this research. Oh, it's good. There's no doubt of it. Ooh. Sorry. Oh, it's good. There's no doubt of it. Uh, and then they talk about the seminar. Uh, but notice that she is the person who brings up the seminar. So she is the person who opens this topic. She is she gives herself the opportunity to tell Stoner that she supports him, that they are on the same side. And this is also a way for her to to uh, find common ground, find something that they both care about together. It's a way of improving their relationship, drawing Stoner closer. Uh, making it a more personal relationship than simply teacher and student. Um, and after they don't do anything that first time, but after he leaves. Uh, I'm on the bottom of page 188. Uh, he notices the environment. He notices the smells and sounds of the city. And tastes of the city also top of 189. It seemed to him that the moment he walked in was enough and that he might not need a great deal more. So this really accurately describes the feeling of being in love for the first time or like even something like seeing a great movie and walking out of the theater, leaving the theater. Or, you know, like reading a good book and finishing it and then looking up around you. The sense of heightened awareness. We talked about this when Stoner first uh, read that sonnet by Shakespeare in class. Remember, uh, he, he doesn't he isn't able to answer Archer Sloan's question, but the, the book tells us that he started noticing things. Things became sharper to him. He became more perceptive. This is the same thing. His interaction with Catherine made him more observant and perceptive and uh, made him more um, happy with the world so that the moment he walked in was enough. This moment right now, this moment in which he is walking home, this moment is enough. Life is good. He is in love. Hey, uh, let's stop here.